Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Jamil Arts Center today. Um, we're really excited to be working with uh, UAE Unlimited and um, Mariah Arts Center on this evening's talk, um, moderated by Laura Metzler, featuring Zara Mahmoud and Tor Zaidel uh, of this year's cohort of artists. Um, so we'll be starting with a conversation, uh, talking about each of their practices, um, and then go into a sort of Q&A at the end of that. Um, with that, I'll leave you in Laura's capable hands and uh, begin. Thank you. Miking? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Lana, for the introduction and Art Jamil uh, for having us. This is our second talk that we've had uh, with Art Jamil and kind of one in a series that we've been doing for the last year and a half um, where we're allowing artists to give a little bit more insight into their practices. Um, just as an introduction, uh, this exhibition is called Tashwish, Material Noise. Um, it is the fifth um, it's the fifth exhibition of UA Unlimited, which is a platform started by uh, His Highness uh, Sheikh Zayed um, uh, bin Sultan bin Khalifa al Nahyan in Abu Dhabi, uh, where they commission younger artists, um, emerging artists within the UAE, uh, to produce new works that ultimately go into the collection. Um, it's becoming a really important platform, um, and so we've all been working together for the last. 10 months, I think, Wow. Um, developing new works. Uh, the exhibition is on until May 25th. Um, this is our first talk. We'll have another one on April 28th at NYU Abu Dhabi, really looking at the commissioning process. Um, but for tonight, uh, each of these artists, wonderful artists who have been really happy to work with, um, are going to be doing uh, conversations about their practice, kind of where their work has developed from um, also a little bit about the experimentation process in developing the work for the exhibition um, and come to Sharjah and see the actual pieces and the final show uh, sometime before May. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with Zara Mahmoud um, and then Tor will go after and we'll have a little bit of conversation about both. So let me switch it over. You see? <clears throat> <clears throat> And there you go. Hi everyone, my name is Zara Mahmood and I'm an artist based in Dubai. I'm originally from Pakistan. Uh, I will be sharing some insights into my studio practice along with images that span my journey as an artist to date. After completing high school, I attended the National College of Arts in Lahore uh, to pursue my undergraduate study where I specialize in printmaking. During my final year as a student in the fine art department, I was making a conscious effort to work towards creating a visual language that was not inclusive of the human figure. And the reason for that was mainly because there was a plethora of sculptures and paintings around me that had the human figure as the dominant subject matter. I became very observant of my surroundings and started to take note of mundane objects and forms that could easily be overlooked by the human eye and started to study their structures and their characteristics to facilitate a narrative, and thought it would be interesting to play on their connotations and symbolism. This first image is called Hypocrisy. It's a print. It's been done using the processes of line etching and aquatint. For those of you who aren't familiar with etching, it involves engraving an image onto metallic surface, which in my case was zinc using acid. And in order to prepare the plate for etching, I first degrease the plate, which involves ridding the surface of any oil stains or fingerprints, as acid doesn't bite through grease. I then applied a black wax ground, which is also commonly known as a hard ground, and using an etching needle, I drew the entire image on the plate. So as I was drawing, I was essentially peeling the black ground off of the plate, revealing the authentic color of the plate. So it's like a negative drawing. And then I placed the image, the plate in the acid bath, and I let the acid engrave the lines uh, in the plate. Then I prepared the plate for a process known as aquatint, which allows you to incorporate tones on your image using acid and the results are similar to the effects of a watercolor wash. And I left the plate in the acid bath for different time durations, with the lightest tone being left in the acid bath for the least amount of time and the darkest being left for the longest. 
This image is called Chinese Whisper, and I'm sure you've all played that game when you were kids, where you whisper a word in someone's ear, and as it travels around a group of people, by the end of it, the word's distorted. A depiction of the distortion of truth. There is a process in gardening called grafting, where you take plants of two different species, you expose parts of their stem, and you bind them together, and the result is a creation of a mixed breed of the two, similar to what you can see in this image which starts off with a seed, which is a representation of purity. And as it grows, grows into a plant, at different stages of the plant's growth, different breeds are being bound to the plant. And the result is a very harsh looking, mainly cacti form. But at the same time, it contains some of the original remnants from the preceding stages, a depiction of the distortion of fact. And again, the process of line etching and aquatint was used. After completing my undergraduate study from NCA and my master's from the Sari Institute of Art and Design, I began to reflect on the works I had created thus far and became aware of the visual vocabulary that my works were taking on and realized that I was immersing myself in a process that involved reversing the worldly mode of seeing by taking things of least importance and shedding on them the kind of attention that is normally reserved for forms of supreme value. Norman Bryson, an art critic and writer, in his exquisitely written book, uh, Looking at the Overlooked, it's, comp it's a compilation of essays on still life genre, mentions that this can happen in two ways, in a descending fashion and in an ascending fashion. From the descending point of view, the worldly scale of importance is questioned and attacked by plunging attention downwards to these trivial forms forcing the eye to discover something in these mundane objects, something that is normally associated with forms of supreme worth. From an ascending point of view, what is valueless becomes priceless. By sustaining the viewer's gaze in this humble milieu, attention gains power to transfigure what is common, allowing the viewer to see things in a new light. Juan Sanchez Cotan, a pioneer in realism in Spain in the 1500s, with his paintings, aimed to shed vision of its worldly education, which is the eye subordination to the world's ideas of what is worthy of attention, and the eye sloth. When vision is left to its own desires, it overlooks 90% of the world in order to follow the path laid down for it by what the world considers spectacular, and by its own desire. The subject's mode of vision is considered to be submissive, according to Bryson. Desire pulls the eye from one direction to another. No object appears clearly because before it can do so, desire is forcing vision to look at another form that's seducing it. The images that appear are in a constant state of eclipse and fading, and vision has no internal resources to resist the tug of desire. With these bodies of works of mine, there is an attempt being made to disarm the habitual manner of seeing, to decondition the habitual, which is a vision that is scattered and disorderly. The enemy here is a mode of vision that thinks in advance what is worthy of attention and what is not. And against that, there is a hope that these images present the constant surprise of things being seen for the first time. This next piece is from a series called The Case of Red. Um, Again, very mundane objects such as buttons, needles, safety pins, and pomegranate seeds became a part of my investigation. These works were drawings on paper, and the media used was graphite, color pencils, and acrylic washes. They're all roughly A0 in size. This next body of work is called Amnesia, the Loss of Culture Memory, which is a show I was creating works for it was being curated by an art critic in Pakistan who was critically analyzing Pakistan's history, particularly the wars of 1965 and 1971, and how, as a nation, we hadn't been engaged in any form of discourse to acknowledge certain mistakes from our past, get closure and move on. That we had selectively erased certain memories from our past, and as a result, um, we were in a state of denial or in a state of latency or dormancy. This image is called the fitting room, and it's composed of a backbone, which is in horizontal orientation. And you can tell it's disjointed in nature. It's not perfectly aligned as a backbone should be. The fractured backbone is a reflection of the encumbering toll orchestrated erasure has taken on Pakistan. The second element introduced are the hangers. 
and they're incorporated to depict the paralysis. And I also found the connotations that hangers carry to be interesting. These are objects that hang behind closed doors inside a closet. And as people, we have a tendency to pile so much weight on one hanger, but we don't mind the disorderly arrangement because we know it's behind closed doors. And the hangers are being pulled down by something that's heavy and yet invisible. The image shows that with time, these phantom memories are tugging at our nation's stability and the damaging repercussions of our collective inability to address these issues is visible in the state of the hangers. This piece is called Inheritance and it's an extension of the fitting room. Again, a very mundane object such as an onion was used. I infused it with an icy blue wash to give it that feeling of being in a state of a coma or being dormant. Pieces of backbone emerge when the onions are being peeled open. A reminder of the need for us as a nation to collectively address these issues from our past, thereby indicating the fruitlessness of our crop as we continue to bury these memories beneath a myriad of layers. This image is from a series called The Dawn on Our Temples Was Stained Red, and it was made specifically in response to an incident that took place over a decade ago in the city of Karachi where a naval base was attacked and held under siege by terrorists, but the <clears throat> works are also a reflection of the growing uncertainty and violence that had gripped my country as a result of the war on terror. This piece shares the title of the series, and it is a study of a teacup, which is an ornament that a bride from the subcontinent wears on her forehead on her wedding day. For this piece, I studied my own tikka and replaced it with pomegranate seeds, which are a symbol of fertility. From afar, they look like precious gems, but upon close inspection, you can see that they're very flesh-like and ripe. And if you look closer, you'll notice these small metallic fragments. <coughs> These are pieces of shrapnel, turning this symbol, what is seen as a symbol of procreation, into a symbol of uh, a form that is laden with tragedy. And the mourning bride is essentially a metaphor for my grieving homeland. This piece is called They Bound Her Melody with Wool, and it shows a pair of anklets. It is constructed out of the same elements as in the preceding image, but has been infiltrated with blue and red wires, colors that you would normally see in a detonational device. And what it's doing is it's transforming this melodious piece of jewelry into a very destructive form that is tinged with anguish at the same time. Both these works were done with acrylics on paper. This piece is called Constituency, and it was done using inks on reeves. At this particular juncture in my practice, I was visiting and investigating botanical forms again, but particularly forms that demonstrate thigmonesty, which is movement in response to touch. And the two species I've studied here are the mimosa pudica, which is also known as a shy plant. It's the three leaves that you see in the drawing, and the pitcher plant at the bottom. The shy plant closes upon contact as a defense mechanism. And the pitcher plant is more aggressive in nature it, uh, when any form tries to engage with it. The juxtaposition of these two species is an attempt to comment on the resistance to diversity or the resistance to the coexistence of diversity. The flower that you see looming on the top adds to the imbalanced uh, nature of this form. And it is the Saracenia flower that grows on the pitcher plant and has a lifespan of about two weeks. This image is one of a total of about 90 drawings that I did uh, called Restless, and it is a study of the movement of the shy plant. And with each drawing, I trace the form as it opens and closes, and I compile these drawings into a flip book, which was then eventually made into an animation. This is also inks on paper. <clears throat> My intrigue with forms that demonstrate thigmonesy continued, and I started to experiment with backgrounds that were gradient backdrops uh, combined with uh, pen and ink drawings. By the time I got into my second drawing, I noticed that the lines were generating a sense of movement, and I wanted to explore that further. Obviously, it was being created because of the combination of the gradient backdrop and the contour drawings on top. But Introducing color into the series, I decided to make what I like to call portraits of these plants by uh, using broken dashes of color. 
and these drawings were an attempt to comment on how almost always plants have been associated with the still life genre and are considered static in nature. And in the static nature of the plants, I was searching for an activeness within these seemingly still beings. My experimentations with these drawings continued and I began to start drawing on a surface called mylar and it's transparent to a certain degree and I started to make layered drawings of plants capturing their movement frame by frame and the result is a blurred drawing showing the movement of a plant from past to present. After doing these drawings for a while, I had come to a point where I realized that it was time to let go of these botanical forms. Temporality and movement were themes that seemed to be recurring in my drawings as of late, but the insistence to hold on to these botanical structures started to feel cumbersome, and I felt they weren't allowing me to progress towards some form of a resolution. Then came a period of much thought and a lot of reflection as to the works that I was producing, and I began working on a new body of work that's called Drawings by Light. In this body of work, I am studying natural light, and how it manifests itself on different surfaces. These images draw parallels to the rituals and routines that constitute life on a daily basis. They leave no physical residue or impression or marks. And these drawings occur daily. Uh, again, they're a very easily overlooked occurrence and they occur without a trace. Drawing as an exercise is steeped in a tradition which is associated with the act of mark making. And as I begin, began to investigate this particular series and study the transient nature of light, I tried mimicking its reflections on paper. And it was only then that I had the realization that I had switched roles with this entity, that light had become the artist and I was the observer. I had to put my pen to rest and try to find ways to capture the impermanence of these drawings to its maximum. These images are all digital prints on acrylic sheets. Thank you. Thanks. And just sit next. And so, <clears throat> thank you, Sarah. I'm really impressive. <laughs> Can I give you this uh, poetry? <laughs> <laughs> Um, introduction. Okay, uh, Tor. My name is Tor Seidel. Um, I'm gonna start with a little introduction on how I um, um, being yeah. educated. Uh, I'm from Berlin in Germany. Uh, I studied, studied um, art and philosophy in um, Berlin, and my professors were Katharina Sieverding and Rebecca Horn. They mostly impressed me by their uh, uh, body performance uh, uh, art uh, and language, and uh, also. Um, <clears throat> where is this? Oh, I, I'm kind of missing this here. Uh, Joseph Boyce. Joseph Boyce, you know, uh, he's uh, mostly um, a big influential um, artist uh, regarding material materiality, works um, fat and um, give it the <laughs> idea. Yeah, um, so, and uh, after. Um, uh, this I studied philosophy. I was uh, um, uh, mostly in, in uh, history of uh, Renaissance philosophy and uh, in the history of alchemy and um, <coughs> the development of uh, natural sciences in um, um, in in philosophy. After uh, using my degrees, I. Um, started to work as a freelance photographer and um, for many magazines and uh, f for architecture and design companies and for um, our clients in uh, mostly in Berlin or in Germany um, examples uh, here and um, before I started to become uh, let's say work uh, again more as an uh, artist in uh, in the field I um, Got, I saw many uh, important shows in, uh, in Berlin. They, were, they made a really important uh, uh, impact on me, like uh, the sensation show of the young British artists um, 
Paul uh, Gabriel Orozco, who is a big um, influence uh, in my work, and um, uh, many others. So, <coughs> sorry for the beginning, it's a little bit <laughs> a little stiff. Um, my first uh, bigger art piece is uh, actually a portrait um, I found um, in an um, abandoned um, military camp, uh, um, abandoned by uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Russian uh, soldiers um, from World War II, uh, a box with uh, x-rays, and uh, I was uh, really interested to understand what uh, was the nature of this kind of uh, portrait. And um, um, I had a discussion with several artists and uh, uh, scientists about what is a portrait, and uh, can we consider an x-ray as a portrait or not. Um, and this is a, let's say, a collaboration with um, uh, artists and uh, scientists. Finally, I made a book, uh, book out of this, and I, um, um, I um, installed the, the x-rays in uh, this um, um, in the uh, sports cell of this uh, um, um, military camp, and. Um, so finally, the, uh, the, out, uh, the, the final outcome for me was the question, what is a portrait, and is a portrait, um, can you consider an X-ray as a portrait or not? So the, the title of the, uh, of the project was X-ray portrait. Um, later, I uh, con, uh, continued with um, asking myself, uh, how do I um, see portrait in uh, contemporary art? Is this uh, something what I uh, like to continue or not, and uh, as I was uh, working as a photographer for magazines, uh, mostly in advertisement and in um, editorial, I was uh, confronted with the situation to shoot uh, portraits, to uh, shoot people. So I started uh, stage photography, um, and uh, those photographs are mostly based on paintings, on uh, novels, as my interest is in literature, and uh, on um, stories. This, for example, is a reference to Vermeer, um, and uh, this is um, based on a story of uh, Jacob Wassermann, um, Kaspar Hauser, maybe uh, you have heard about that or you read his uh, uh, novel, and uh, this is about a, uh, often a child, um, and uh, what you see is uh, I'm going to work with mostly with masks or with uh, back uh, portraits. I'm going to call this back portraits. This is um, a reference to Tim Buckley's Song to the Siren. He um, had a, Tim Buckley is a, a well known, uh, so, was a well known songwriter, and he had a tour and um, in, in the Mississippi. Um, <coughs> Um, and after uh, they play this band and uh, they, they staged, um, he uh, drowned into the uh, Mississippi. Um, so there was something coming back um, uh, by this, let's say, song, Song to the Siren. Um, this is based on my uh, studies on Francis Bacon. And so finally, um, I'm still doing this kind of stage photography. Um, it is uh, becoming more surrealistic now. Um, uh, finally, I, let's say, exercised uh, my uh, art practice and my questions in um, how to work uh, with human figure and portrait and, uh, and uh, conceptual photography. Um, when I came to Dubai or to the UE, I was, I have to start with this, I was uh, really interested in um, this uh, combination of um, desert and uh, cityscape, which is uh, most uncommon for someone from Germany. Um, I haven't seen this before, so I started the uh, photo series uh, um, about Dubai, and I was, um, yeah, really impressed also by uh, a situation when I came to Dubai 2009-2008 that I found many places abandoned, etc. And I made this book with Hatje Kanz, it's a um, quite well-known publisher in Germany. The book uh, uh, won the German uh, Photo Book Award 2015 
And later on, I uh, started uh, this book about, um, I call them mannequins. Um, so um, you notice those flagments made by street workers. And um, I found them in a way, uh, 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 art pieces, artworks by themselves, uh, made all, uh, out of uh, ready-made and uh, found objects, etc. Um, and I was wondering, uh, because if you uh, put, would put them into another context, like into the street of Germany, you would, might think this is, a, um, that's a, this, this is street art, or that's, yeah, it's commissioned by someone, but uh, here, uh, barely, there is no offer for that, yeah? So uh, they are made by uh, workers. They don't consider themselves as artists, and I, I find this really interesting. And they are kind of representatives of uh, those people there uh, build them. And uh, also here I found again this, uh, this context of um, no face or no portrait, etc. Um, in Germany, I uh, did a research about um, nuclear power plants, and uh, we have a big dis discussion about um, exit of this kind of technology. Um, and I was shooting in some of those uh, nuclear power plants for, uh, for another book uh, project, um, mostly um, under protective uh, clothing. And, um, yeah, I found this uh, quite, uh, yeah, ambivalent, I have to say, uh, being in those uh, um, uh, rooms and spaces hermetic, uh, hermetically sealed, you can describe them, and made by, uh, yeah, engineers and, uh, let's say, civilization. Um, you cannot simply enter them, and you cannot simply exit them, um, because it's, everything is, uh, quite um, a stressful uh, a security uh, system uh, what you have to um, um, what, what you have to um, uh, follow and I was asking myself why is uh, why those uh, spaces exist without um, any attention by let's say the society so we in Germany have a really let's say big big discussion about this. And uh, I guess it's also quite diverse in, in Europe how to handle that. Um, so this year's was, um, I guess, one of the, uh, uh, let's say, studies about how uh, abandoned places and how uh, hermetically sealed uh, um, spaces and rooms um, work together. Um, <coughs> I come to something that is related to uh, Tashvish, yeah? Um, <laughs> um, I'm really uh, fascinated by uh, one material, which is soap, and I st um, I, uh, it starts with, uh, mostly with something else. Uh, it, it started with uh, smell. Um, I uh, went uh, over a souk in uh, Central Asia, and I found uh, quite, uh, um, uh, quite unnormal uh, appearing um, um, objects. They are made. Uh, they were made by soap. And asked people, "What is it?" And they said, hey, "Okay, that's, that's soap." And they uh, smelled quite strange. And since that time, I am uh, collecting soaps. Um, um, and um, I started with a. I started with an installation in Berlin where uh, I assembled more than 700 soaps in a tiny gallery space and uh, people were walking around this uh, installation um, and they were starting to tell uh, stories and uh, to uh, reveal their memories and I was wondering why this is happening because I hadn't any idea about uh, how smell or the smell is uh, triggering. Uh, something like uh, uh, memory or um, stories or associations, and uh, this is starting point for the project uh, in at, uh, at um, Maraya. Mm. Um, in the beginning, I also tried to find, let's say, a system to organize, um, pre, let's say, 
pre-scientific um, objects or ephemeral objects in, uh, in a uh, system and uh, this is kind of related to um, systems uh, of Darwin, Linné and, uh, and Steckel. They started to collect uh, objects and uh, they um, also investigated the let's say, relations and the connection between them and uh, tried to understand the context of that. Um, coming back to this, I was uh, a kid uh, when I uh, saw a big fire, a, a blaze in a house and um, I was stood there and I remember that I was seeing it smells like burning cheese. And a man next to me said, uh, looked at me and he said to me, you are burning cheese. <laughs> so this came back when I started, uh, when it started with soap um, as a story. Um, so there's obviously something with, between um, the sense of smell and uh, memory. Yeah, it's a direct connection to the hippocampus. Um, and uh, then obviously there's a happening, a decision if this is very, uh, to be sorted into the long uh, term memory or not. And uh, the question is how does it come back? So, and I, I found that mem memory is nothing uh, if it's not manifested in something like, um, is it not, is, if memory is not retrieved or re revealed in, uh, in text or in uh, art work or in, um, in language. And uh, I guess that's the starting point for, the, for our project, projects. Here I also worked with SOAP as a material. I was really um, interested in how to uh, work with my hands. Um, and uh, that's, this piece is called The Holy Boys. So it's, uh, irony about um, the situation of, or, let, um, um, or, or let's say the distinctive uh, position of a super artist in, uh, in the art business, yeah? Um, like uh, his remains uh, become relics. And um, the first work I did with soap uh, in, in the UE is this. Um, uh, it was played as a Tashkil uh, soap <coughs> box with soaps uh, collected uh, in the UE. Um, and uh, the soaps are sealed also with uh, glass. It's uh, like a, um, a framed uh, glass piece. And next to this uh, box uh, is um, a description about metaf metaphors uh, of smell on, uh, or a, let's say hypothetical um, um, uh, smell space and uh, as a viewer you might ask what is the connection between the description and the um, presentation and you cannot smell but you can read how does it smell and there's ob obviously something what yeah is uh, hidden behind that and uh, this is related to what I said what memory is obviously uh, nothing without representation or without uh, manifestation so the, um, the next work, or let's say the work for uh, uh, Tashvish, uh, is based on this. I collected more soaps, and um, that's um, an image for, th for this displaying the, um, the soaps they, uh, I collected here in, um, in Sharjah and in Ashman. And uh, they are the basement for my uh, work, um, first of all, collection. And then I started to interview uh, via a questionnaire uh, people. Um, I asked them simple questions about uh, what do they smell and uh, what do they uh, associate or what they, do they memorize when they are going to smell this specific soap. Um, ah, here is the soap box. And um, I got really interesting uh, answers. Um, um, and I also asked um, uh, questions that are more related to synesthetic experiences like do you see uh, or do you hear a, a sound or do you see a color when you smell this and uh, it was surprising that I got uh, uh, quite um, um, quite unexpected uh, answers like someone said yeah I see weakness as colors and um, I was going deeper and deeper and deeper and this uh, anyhow um, uh, finally you can consider this as a 
data set full of informations. First of all, uh, it is uh, it has the informations of the distribution, uh, um, um, the origin, um, the color, of course, and also maybe this, uh, the smell and ingredients. And um, then there's this layer, which is um, the content of um, subjective associations, memories, stories, and um, so um, the next step was for me uh, thinking about how I can um, transform this into a new order to find uh, a new system out of uh, many, many uh, informations uh, uh, um, um, I started to transform soaps, I shredded them, I uh, melted them, I cast it in, into a form, and um, I tried to find a new um, uh, system. And uh, you see those twice. Here is uh, um, an image which shows the pro uh, is um, uh, illustrating the process, and as, uh, I was thinking about how to display them in in a um, in an order in a color uh, space in a. Uh, in a form that uh, it um, uh, it appears as a um, as a new system, yeah. Um, and the reference to, or let's say, the link to this is um, spectrum, spectrum uh, of a star, for example. Yeah, it's a light spectrum where you have an array of colors in a systematic order. And finally, um, this. Um, is the piece spectrum, so that's um, a data set uh, encoded <laughs> with all those informations, and um, you see um, you see an array of colors, and um, they are those ingots are embedded into a base uh, plate of soap, and yeah, that's uh, one piece, and the other piece. Um, all the other, the other artwork is um, uh, <coughs> sent field where I started to uh, invite the viewer more into into an active process. So um, I was wondering why the, how those texts can be more be, become a part of um, uh, of my let's say studies and research and how um, smell is working and triggering. Etc. And um, I um, crafted or uh, casted soaps. Uh, so I, um, I designed a, a, a kind of um, new soaps made by uh, several ingredients. They are mostly based on the texts I um, have. You can see there, and uh, the, the, text, the texts are um, uh, excerpts of uh, those interviews. Um, and if the viewer goes into the, um, let's say, um, uh, explore this, uh, sorry, I go back to this here, is open this compartment, uh, one of the, those compartments, he's gonna start to smell the soap and then he's uh, starting to blend this with um, the text he can read or with another text yeah, to understand um, how his experience is uh, yeah, um, probably um, aligned with the experience of the author of uh, those texts. The, um, that's uh, for me a really interesting um, um, piece because um, here it became clear that um, memory is nothing yeah, without um, manifestation. And um, I was really, uh, really um, uh, happy also that I could start with uh, to work with text in relation uh, in relation to. Um, an existing um, piece, and um, that I was also happy that this is not only about visuality, yeah, so visualization, it is um, more something about what you cannot see, but you're gonna smell. Um, synesthetic experiences are um, probably the next um, step I wanna uh, start to go. And um, I got this, um, uh, let's say, example for how a fountain works um, f uh, to illustrate what I mean. Um, you have a fountain where water is coming out, and this water has a really uh, huge amount of uh, sulfur. Yeah, and uh, you're gonna start to drink this um, 
water and uh, you taste the water, you're gonna smell the sulfur and you're gonna see the color at the same time. So this is a kind of um, um, experiment or let's say um, um, tool to understand what uh, synesthesia is. Um, and this is a, let's say, um, that's a simple example in, in nature we can find. Um, recently I started to work on uh, another piece of soap what is uh, also more related to synesthesia. So this is a combination of um, color plus uh, smell where uh, the color plays a bigger role. Uh, so you remember that uh, uh, I got the, that the report from one of my authors who said um, he, uh, she sees sweetness as colors and I uh, was wondering how this, uh, how can I translate this into a form? And uh, this is what we see here, it's a kind of an octave, yeah? Um, you know, it's from music uh, uh, based on eight parts in a, a um, certain uh, array. And um, um, so the view is uh, opening those, uh, there are three holes um, when you see the, the box uh, and uh, starting to smell. And at the same time, uh, the viewer, the visitor is uh, seeing the soap, the color of the soap and con can contemplate. I um, guess that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I was a little bit <clears throat> okay. um, like kind of nervous. <laughs> no, don't worry. Uh, thank you for both of you. Um, it's nice, but it was a good introduction to you know the pieces that you've done. I wanted to go ahead for each of you to pull out a little bit more of kind of the process of the newer works, um, because for both of you during UA Unlimited, you've made this kind of shift, or we're like already in the process of thinking about it, but like through this commissioning process, have really made different work from what you were doing before. So um, and Zara, we've had these conversations um, about kind of this relationship with drawing and with etching, and like the interest in doing the drawings with light um, versus the kind of the actual digging in. Like, uh, and one of the things that I really love about the new commissions and the drawings by work, uh, drawing by light work is also kind of the engagement with the wall and like how you've angled it. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to see if you could kind of talk about that relationship and also like the different trials and different ways of thinking and scaling and like, cause you've been going through a whole, that. yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a really nice, um, uh, like conversation that you've had with that dialogue. Um, and I think Campus Art Dubai also played oh, yeah. a part in that conversation, if you wanted to. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned in my practice, I was always interested in looking at the overlooked. And I was always pulled to the idea of connotations and symbolism. And then by the time I started revisiting those botanical forms again, um, at that time, movement started to uh, become uh, a reappearing, like a recurring theme in my works, which is when I made the animation and I was doing campus art the Baya at the time. Um, and drawings by light is literally a distillation of everything that I've done. All the components are there. The drawings are there conceptually. Another entity is conducting these drawings. And it was very difficult for me to hold my hand back and not replicate but I had to do justice to this form that is transient. And I think it's about what you're trying to convey. And you have to try and do it justice with whatever medium possible to convey the message. And by the time I had reached that body of work, it was more about the transient nature of these drawings that don't leave any marks. And I have experimented with the digital prints on clear acrylic sheets. I'm continuing to work with that. And I'm also trying to find other processes that really capture the impermanence uh, of these drawings. So I've been working lately with the photographic transfers on fabric. And photographic transfer is a printing process again. And it involves extracting a very thin layer of a printed image, which these images are all photographs. And it's a very sensitive process, again, because they're all very ephemeral in nature. I mean, these digital prints on acrylic sheets from the back, they're exposed. They are, you know, they're left at the discretion of atmosphere and dust. And they can transform and take on their own meaning. With time, they can age 
And the same thing for these photographic transfers as well. They're very sensitive and can completely change at, you know, upon physical contact. So again, it's what I'm trying to convey through these works. And I have to try and find the medium that suits that concept you know, and just does it justice. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, and with Tor, I wanted to kind of think more about the soap as a data set. We had a lot of like <laughs> conversations about that as well. And um, I mean, so you've collected over like 2,000 kinds of soap, I think you'd, you'd said. Yeah. Um, in and like, in Germany, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and like one yeah. of the works that we had talked about that you had done, you were thinking of them as also like an atlas. Um, yeah, and like thinking of those scents as different, you know, almost like trade routes or like connotations and memories with different communities and thinking of that. Um, and so I was, I, like I wanted to kind of talk more about like also how that data set is then almost is presented, um, like because with spectrum also like the removing of the shape of the bars and like putting them into the same molds. Um, the piece that you actually see, the final piece, they don't. A lot of them don't look like they went into the same molds because of those properties. So maybe you can kind of talk about it as a data set and how you've been thinking of it as a data set because we also went through a lot of sort of thoughts of how to gather it or put it together. Um. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean. You, you mentioned or yet you was using this fantastic word it's blue blueprint of data yeah so mm -hmm. um, and uh, what we see is, is a kind of a, let's say several layers of blueprints yeah uh, in the in this in the spectrum um, and uh, they are encoded of course yeah so um, you cannot read them um, but you could so mm -hmm. it's possible that I, uh, I was thinking when I saw this fantastic exhibition there. And um, in an exhibition room, yeah, um, this uh, cyanotypes. Um, I was thinking about uh, doing finally something with the, uh, let's say, decoding uh, mm -hmm. those uh, information somehow and transporting, uh, let's say, tr transporting them into um, cyanotypes, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, a, let's say, a useful con uh, um, combination or let's say relation. Um, but yeah. Fin First of all, the question for me was, uh, um, if I have this as a piece, which is uh, an encoded uh, data set, and uh, I have texts, yeah, they're going to uh, keep and contain all those informations uh, of the authors, I call them authors, then uh, this is fine, and this is uh, perfect. And um, whenever you need to read this, you can read this. And uh, on the other side, you see it, and uh, maybe there's coming a kind of after reading a lot of those uh, texts, after uh, uh, from the in interviews, there's coming uh, a moment where you're gonna start to understand more when you look at it uh, at the spectrum, uh, what is in there, yeah, or also understand more about soaps. So soap, uh, I mean, it's such an ephemeral object and uh, banal and nobody uh, yeah, is thinking about this and uh, but like also really personal I mean it's really personal yeah. uh, it's an in, intime yeah it has it is, it is touching the body and uh, it has many many connotations and it is also about um, um, purification yeah so uh, purification which is um, um, a component um, in uh, so let's say enhancing and making civilization and uh, also it has, plays a big role in uh, religion, religions, etc. So there's much about uh, the role of soap as well as an uh, object and as a material. And uh, it's not only this, uh, the smell of the soap. Yeah. So it's also of like course. really amazing how detailed a lot of the kind of memories and associations with them have been. I think one of the texts is like, this one smells like the sound of the oven like timer. Um, going off in like a kitchen, like when my mom is do like did this thing, like was making this one particular item, um, and kind of and so like the texts also with the the scent fields are then these kind of collective memories, but trying to have them layered was quite interesting because you then like took all of the data sets and then blended them. Right. Um, um, the yet. Yeah. The interesting point of, uh, uh, about the text is that there's so many diverse informations and uh, associations and memories. And in the beginning, I was thinking, okay, everyone is talking about 
uh, grandma's house and how does it uh, smell and uh, how it was when grandma was washing me in the bathroom mm. yeah, with uh, um, uh, awful the soap, etc., etc. But uh, it, it's much uh, more diverse, let's say, uh, complex. And um, um, I, I guess um, many of those memories and associations, they are and this is the interesting, uh, most interesting uh, point for me. They they came, oops, out of the blue, yeah, yeah, by smelling this specific soap. And uh, this is what I started to uh, explain. Uh, memory is nothing uh, without retrieve or reveal them in yeah in a medium or so conveyed in to a, to a medium a form and. Uh, I, I found this, uh, found this uh, fantastic. Also, coming back to the synesthetic uh, uh, thing, uh, I found there are many, many um, interview partners, uh, uh, offers, they, uh, they started to uh, uh, um, illustrate, uh, let's say, uh, um, to give stories about what they see or what, what they hear when they see this specific soap or what they're going to smell. and. Um, not just the, the weekdays, and mm. uh, that's so interesting um, that uh, for me that was a really big, um, and really um, useful and um, um, let's say it, it was like a big study, yeah, mm. while, uh, working on this project. Mm. Right. We're kind of running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience if anybody has them. Okay. Lana has a question. Um, I wanted to know which one of the soaps uh, evoked the most moving memory for you. Personally? Yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> you made other people do the survey, so I was wondering if yeah. you did it yourself. <coughs> Yeah, there's one soap, I, we have it here, the tar soap. Um, it's not really the tar soap, but it's a kind of a tar soap. So tar, yeah, it sm uh, smells really strong. And uh, I have one of her who was um, smelling on that, that soap, and she was writing, okay, this smells like the smoke in the streets of Cairo. And when we are sitting as uh, kids on the balcony, and uh, we uh, used to smoke, and we, uh, but, you know, um, made him out in, in the ashtray, etc., uh, et and also the smell of the streets of Cairo. It's really strong related to this. And my wife bring me uh, many soaps from Russia. Uh, they, uh, I, I don't know uh, exactly for what they do they use uh, tar soap in Russia. Yeah. Closest, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has a really strong and, and strange um, uh, smell. And there is something what is triggering you and what is... <laughs> It is pulling you, um, yeah. And the sulfur, the sulfur, the sulfur soap, yeah, the other, the yellow one, um, because this is most mostly about purification. Yeah, um, it, it has something. Um, yeah, you have to experience this. <laughs> one of them smells kind of like an old casino floor <laughs> when you open it. It's always. Yeah, I think it's, but it's a because there's something there's like something sweet underneath it too. It's like yeah. <coughs> Additionally, this is um, what I uh, f didn't expect it to find in the UE is that, uh, let's say, which amount of soaps I uh, was thinking, okay, uh, most of the soaps, they are imported, of course they are, yeah, and they are probably for five or ten, uh, from five or ten different countries, that's it, but not, uh, they are from probably 50 or uh, more, and uh, there are so many diverse uh, versions, uh, and it's completely different where you're gonna start to buy them. Yeah, there's uh, different in Ajman, it's different in Sharjah, in different parts of Sharjah, like an in industrial area, you, f uh, you find completely, yeah, more cheap and uh, soaps or uh, as you go, uh, when you go to uh, University City or to some parts of Dubai. Okay. Yeah. And Zara, I wanted to know, I know you have different kinds of practice, um, whether it's music, you're also an educator. Um, through your own practice as an artist and the evolution, has your approach to all of those other aspects of your life changed? Aspects to those, at, meaning 
Sorry, can you repeat that again? For example, if um, you were going through a more minimalist phase in your illustrations, did yeah. your music also evolve in that direction or what you were teaching to your students? Not necessarily. I think uh, because normally the courses that I teach are pretty foundational. Um, I feel like everything does sort of feed into each other. It may not be that my practice necessarily informs my teaching. My teaching could inform my practice. Um, being in a band definitely affects my practice. And I think the temporality aspect that sort of came in my works as of late, I'm sure subconsciously some there, there, uh, somewhere there is an underlying parallel to music and how you know, records don't have, they don't leave any marks. There are these transient forms of art which affect us emotionally. And I'm sure somewhere I had a dream and I just <laughs> had that sort of revelation and I was like, I'll do this. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah. And then uh, Zara is teaching a workshop here on Saturday uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, looking at architecture and light around the Jamil space. Uh, so please come, check it out, enjoy, draw some beautiful things, work with Zara. And thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.